Welcome everyone to, I think, what is the, the last dream seminar of the spring semester. And, uh, and for this, uh, I'm delighted to welcome back Jeff Jensen, uh, who is a Berkeley alum. Um, Jeff uh, was an undergrad here uh, 10, 11, mm -hmm. he graduated about 10 or 11 years ago. Um, and he was one of the, the adventurous undergrads who took the very first introduction to embedded systems that Edward and I co-taught uh, way back in 2008. And, uh, and then he went on to be uh, uh, a big contributor and evangelist for the course. And uh, even, even today, the students who take the course use a lab uh, book that has been authored in large part by Jeff. Um, so then after Berkeley, Jeff went on to National Instruments, where he continued to be a, a core technologist, you know, uh, coding and implementing stuff but also being a bridge with sales and marketing, which I don't know how you pull that off, but <laughs> he did that for five years. And then um, the startup bug bit him, and so he, he went on to what was called uh, Momentum Machines, which is uh, the name for what is now called Creator, uh, which is the robotic burger-making startup that he's been at for the last five odd years, and he's been director of software there. So it's delightful to have Jeff back and tell us about uh, the adventures he's been happen having over here. Okay, welcome, Jeff. All right, thank you, Sanjit. And it is a pleasure to be here. Hi, I'm Jeff. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, some maybe a bit more of a practical approach to cyber physical systems. I think a lot of the topics here go into research depth that is frankly way beyond me. Um, but I think that uh, having just gone through the process of building a cyber physical system and launching it in a startup environment, uh, there's a certain practical approach to cyber physical systems that I think you might find interesting. Uh, I've been a creator for about five years and uh, we'll tell you more about what we're doing there. Um, but the first I just want to call some shots on what I think is going to be the future of automation. Uh, personal opinions of the direction that I think automation is going to be going. Um, the first is that automation is going to be melding with cloud computing. I don't think I have to convince anyone here of this. I think you've already seen parts of that starting to happen. I think you're going to see a lot more cloud-controlled robots. You're going to see a lot more edge devices. You're going to see a lot more IoT. Uh, and that trend is only going to continue. Um, I believe that programmable logic controllers and industrial embedded controllers are not innovating at a fast enough pace, and that the ecosystems around open source and uh, off-the-shelf, inexpensive embedded hardware are going to catch up pretty quickly. I believe that automation is going to be ubiquitous, not just in the industrial space, but also in the commercial and eventually in the consumer space. So there is an inevitability to what Creator and many other companies are working on. Uh, factories are going to be more flexible and reconfigurable. This we've been saying for a long time. Not quite sure we've hit the bar yet, but uh, I believe with techniques like agile development and rapid prototyping, along with new research being done in the space, that we'll see factories that are far more reconfigurable. And lastly, open source hardware and open source software is going to catch up to the existing proprietary systems. I think the ecosystem that exists around open source hardware and open source software is ultimately something that will carry a lot of this automation forward in a way that uh, proprietary solutions cannot. So I want everyone here to just take a few seconds and ask yourselves, what does a hamburger robot look like? Think of all the things necessary for grinding, cooking, slicing, everything just in time, and assembling and delivering it completely hands-free. And what does a solution like that physically look like? And you might think something like this. This is uh, an image of a Nestle press release of a new laboratory that opened somewhat uh, recently. It's a little fuzzy to tell, but there's a, a marching band in the back there to celebrate the ribbon cutting. And you see slides and 80-20 and lots of stainless steel. And I'm sure it's, from a sanitary standpoint, uh, above reproach. but. Uh, does it look like something you want to eat from? Well, let me show you what we built.
So I think the future of commercial automation looks something more like this. And this is the actual device in the restaurant, uh, which is open to the public three days a week right now. Uh, and we'll be expanding that in the future. And this is the device that makes a gourmet hamburger from scratch. So I think when you see this, you realize that we're designers first before we're engineers, that we care more about the experience and the gourmet aspects of the food than the technology that delivers it. So on the other aspect of the restaurant, we've really focused on human-centered design. Our, our founder, uh, Alex Vartacostas, actually gave a talk at Berkeley not long ago on human-centered design. That's a core principle of him. It's something that's built into the company. And some of the quotes you'll see from the press around us. In the back, you'll see several books that are things that have inspired us, everything from Michael Pollan to somewhere in there is our embedded systems book from uh, uh, 149 here at Berkeley, also a book from the computability course here uh, in the math department at Berkeley. Uh, I also snuck in Jean-Paul Sartre. And, uh, uh, other books that have inspired us, including those from Alice Waters and on the culinary side. The portals you see here in the, uh, in the tables actually showcase the ingredients that are in the burgers that we make. Um, another thing to notice, there is no light emitting screens. We don't like the idea of walking into a restaurant and having, being inundated by advertising and people telling you what to buy. Uh, instead, we want it to be centered around the human aspect of the experience, so taking a lot of design aesthetic from nature. And that was in the robot as well. Um, you'll notice lots of wood, stone, and uh, transparency into the refrigeration system. Because we show you what we're making, we don't have to advertise. We're, that's what we're making. You get to see the product exactly as, uh, as we do. So a few quotes about the launch of the restaurant. It was uh, something that made a national headlines and started an interesting discussion around where the future of dining is going to be. We're very pleased with uh, the commentary so far. Uh, recently, Sohail Lee, who's a food writer for the San Francisco Chronicle, uh, wrote an article about us and discussed this as a uh, love the burger, love the fries, love the experience, which was a high bar for us to hit from the food writer of the Chronicle, which tells you that we're doing something a little bit different when we get uh, a review like that for a $6 burger. Um, and with the benefits of automation, we can spend more on the core ingredients that go into the burger and still hit higher margins than our competitors. And that's what happens when you have a categorically disruptive technology like automation in the commercial space. So we're really the first ever to do just-in-time dispensing for an assembled and cooked food product like this. There's really nothing out there quite like it. It's also why it took us a while to get here. Cooking burgers is really hard. And it took us a lot of trial and error. And I want to talk a little bit about the evolution of the system as we built it. Um, just a little bit about me. Uh, my DNA has software in it. I first programmed on an Apple II and learned Apple Basic. Um, and then subsequently, my first ever robot I programmed was in Lego Logo, which is based off of MIT's logo, which is a variant of Lisp. Uh, and this was a precursor to um, Lego Mindstorms, um, which I ended up having some connection with a little bit later in my career. I uh, landed here at Berkeley. I uh, studied under Edward and was advised also by Sanjit. This is a photograph of me working uh, up on the fifth floor with the iRobot Create, which is the platform that's used for a number of the experiments in the 149 Introduction to Embedded Systems Laboratory. Uh, this was a pivotal course for me as I had kind of gotten, frankly, wasn't sure where I was going to go next in academia. I kind of burned out on what I thought was going to be a career in signal processing, realized I would spend a lot of time in MATLAB and wasn't sure if that's where I wanted to spend my career. Uh, and this course really rejuvenated me and how, how much breadth it required to be able to build even a simple solution like a self-driving vacuum cleaner. Um, so this is uh, working on some of the laboratory curriculum for that course. And then I uh, continued on to do a master's here and uh, did it on the topic of model-based design for cyber physical systems. Really also taking that breadth-first approach of the design methodology 
for approaching a complex system like this from a design standpoint and coming up with some basic guidelines or recommendations for how you might tackle that problem. Um, and then subsequently, I had the opportunity to work with, uh, with Edward and Sanjit on uh, opening up this course to a massive open online course through edX, where we had a total of 9,000 students enrolled, and a uh, number of them uh, were seeing this content for the first time. We saw them from all across the world and worked on what I still think was a really innovative approach to an open laboratory educational platform. So one of the things we worked on was a 3D physics simulator for this self-driving vacuum cleaner where students were designing the control algorithms, everything from interpreting the sensor data to writing a, a state machine controller for the robot and responding to that sensor data to achieve a goal. And we had this 3D simulator that we were able to distribute and uh, one of the amazing things with, with some of the research that Sanjit and his group had been doing on a project they called CPS Greater, which was um, incorporating a signal temporal logic uh, with some advanced algorithms and techniques to basically grade students' performance on open-ended laboratories. So you're given a 3D environment, your robot can drive anywhere and perform exactly as your controller would tell it to do, and we were able to catch common failure modes such as jitter or the robot turning around in circles because it used strict equality to reorient itself. Regardless of where it was in the environment or the sequence of events that had led it there, it was the first ever, in my knowledge, graded, open-ended laboratory course in a robotics curriculum, um, which I think is a really, that was a really fun thing to work on. Um, and uh, really enjoyed seeing students who were posting up YouTube videos of their simulators working and then students who had the resources to get physical hardware and actually build one of these iRobot systems themselves were posting videos of their same software running on the real robot with little or no modification from what had actually been running in the simulator. Um, so it was a high bar and it was an interesting experience and I think students uh, really enjoyed it from what we, we saw in the feedback. I later went to join National Instruments. I, after all that time focusing on my engineering degrees, decided that product marketing was the next step for me naturally. Um, but it was still in a highly technical capacity in supporting uh, advanced research and trying to connect with people who see market trends ahead of industry, such as academicians, helping to support that research and bring that knowledge back in to help National Instruments build the tools that they would need to advance that research. Um, this is a photograph uh, taken in Transylvania. Uh, it turns out the Technical University of Cluj and Apoca has a particularly strong skill set in FPGA. And so I assisted with the opening of a new laboratory there uh, named for National Instruments. And that's uh, me together at the presentation for the, the signing of the um, official opening together with the uh, inventor of uh, LabVIEW, the first graphical programming language that was used uh, under the concept of a virtual instrument that was used for data acquisition systems. Uh, then subsequently I joined Creator. Uh, I was the first person to join who was not a mechanical engineer. And one thing you learn when you are the first person to join who's got a CS background is that you also become the de facto IT department, which I've done begrudgingly. Um, this is a photograph in the restaurant uh, just weeks before we opened. Uh, we had maintained a complete stealth mode prior to opening. Um, people had no idea what the restaurant was going to look like, what the robot was going to look like. Um, and so we had a lot of anticipation, hoping things would be performing well, that people would like it. And uh, we're also working, of course, very hard, as with any big project, to wrap up all the odds and ends that are necessary for the machine to run smoothly in a completely autonomous mode. Um, so, now talking on to the, the topic for this is on the topic of cyber physical systems. One thing I learned about cyber physical systems, especially when you go to conferences on cyber physical systems, is the first slide is always a definition of cyber physical systems. I think that's kind of a unique thing to that field that everyone is still defining and redefining it a little bit, which means there's still a little bit of flux into what everyone's understanding and interpretation of cyber physical systems are. Uh, certainly our burger robots are not exoplanetary in scale, um, but they do have a lot of aspects of cyber physical systems built into them. So I will share a definition of cyber physical systems just so we're all somewhat on the same page, uh, that they are systems that uh, deeply integrate physical processes and computation, uh, typically in feedback control loops, 
and uh, that these physical effects and physical computations will affect the computation vice versa, so deeply integrated physical um, and computing components. So the three C's to remember for this are communication, computation, and control. And the uh, small graphic that illustrates some uh, aspects of this, so the control might be your stability system for your car, braking system, communication could be vehicle to vehicle, which we're seeing probably more, more imminent, um, emergency services or satellites, which they've had for some time with OnStar and others. Um, and then the computation, I mean, you know how many ECUs are in uh, cars these days. There's a lot of com computation that's happening. And I think all of these are very much present in the robot that we built. So this is a very high level and crude diagram of the first ever cyber physical restaurant. So the diagram here shows on the left a uh, point of sale and uh, a mobile app that are all connected directly to the cloud to the restaurant. And then in the restaurant, we have two robots that are there who are both producing burgers during our open hours. Each robot itself is a distributed system. So it's a heterogeneous distributed system. There are over 20 computers and microcontrollers inside of the device that are all communicating with each other. Uh, there are over 350 sensors and actuators in this robot, over 250,000 lines of handwritten C++ code. That's a lot of code to manage. Uh, I mean, certainly some systems get larger. You can get millions in, in, in cars. Uh, but for the first version of a product, that's, uh, that's a lot to take on. And that only speaks to handwritten C++ code. There's a lot of generated C++ code where uh, they're coming from state machines that have you know, hundreds and hundreds of states as well. There are miles of wiring inside the device. And there is coordination across the devices. They don't physically interact, but uh, when an order is placed for the restaurant, we have to decide which robot will service it. And that leads to a series of very interesting queuing questions based on what's loaded in each machine. What can actually service that request? Um, is there a machine that's running low? How would they coordinate that? Um, is the machine going into cleaning mode so it should not produce for a little bit of time? These are all some of the, the considerations where the robots themselves need to coordinate who's going to be servicing the request from the guest. And uh, we've collected over a billion data points from these two robots uh, in a very short amount of time. And these are all stored in the cloud, just waiting for analysis from someone who knows a lot more about data analysis than I do. The uh, kind of data we're collecting is all real time and visible in web interfaces. This is showing you the current draw across a reciprocator during a period where he's slicing an onion. And uh, that's actually a fairly characteristic curve for this problem. I don't exactly know why the peaks are there, but if I were to guess, my guess is you might be hitting different layers of the onion as you slice through. And then that last bit at the end is the skin of the onion. There's a little skin that hangs on just at the end that we put in a little bit of extra effort to make sure we slice off. And that's just one of the 350 sensors and actuators in the system that are recording data as the uh, machine is operating. The HMI is a wearable. We're using the Apple Watch as the primary HMI to this cyber-physical system. And I think it speaks to how this is not a human-in-the-loop system in the sense that it does fully autonomously produce hamburgers, but it still does work in a restaurant space together with uh, restaurant staff members. And so the idea of combining a wearable with this really made a lot of sense to us. And so you'll see an example of this here. The uh, tomato slicer is slicing a tomato. Let's say that tomato fell off and onto the conveyor below, which would presumably uh, prevent the conveyor from advancing the burger. Uh, there is actually a way that we can detect that, and the uh, staff will receive a notification on their Apple Watch, letting them know that there was an issue and how to clear it. And then once the staff has cleared the issue, they swipe up on the watch, and the machine will proceed. So, while it's uh, autonomous in almost all instances, in the cases where it's not able to be autonomous, we are able to lean on the staff to help assist it and keep it moving forward. So some of the design challenges that come from a CPS standpoint that relate to this are that there are many coordination points. 
Just for example here, this is what we call the tray station. It's a tray that presses the, uh, the completed burger forward for the staff to retrieve and serve to the guest. You'll see that uh, it has the conveyor is just to the right that ends and pushes the box onto that last station there. Then right as that happens, you want to have the uh, seasoning for the top side of the burger be dispensed through that diffuser directly above it. So there's actually a little pneumatic dif diffuser there that has taken whatever seasoning you selected and will dispense that in the size of a patty. First on the top part of the bun, so you have the seasoning on the top patty. And then once the patty has been placed on the burger, again on the bottom of the patty, which allows for better seasoning to beef distribution, but also it uh, allows you to have different seasonings on either side of the palate, which actually has a big effect from a culinary standpoint. So there is a griddle, an electric griddle, uh, to the left of what you see here that is cooking in parallel as this box is moving forward with all of the ingredients. You want that burger to come off while it's as hot as it can be and also so you can get the burger out of the machine as fast as possible. So it needs to time itself with that box as it gets to the end of the conveyance. Now, this has to happen irrespective of what you chose to dispense, what the guests wanted to have in their burger. So if they're skipping tomato and onion, it might move a little bit faster down the line. You still want that timing to line up. Once the burger has been placed down, the spatula that places it needs to get out of the way of the box for the box to move forward. And then it needs to come right back to the griddle to retrieve the next burger as it's coming through. That's actually a lot of coordination in one small space. And the timing does matter. It's not hard real time. Uh, and that's actually something we've taken a lot of advantage of. But there are a lot of timing constraints that span multiple subsystems. And uh, I'll talk about one of those in, in a moment as well. The restaurant team is still going to be interacting with the machine. It will be refilling uh, ingredients as they are running out and dispensed. If there is an issue like a tomato falling on the conveyor, they can open up the refrigeration system and retrieve it. So there you see burgers are still being produced. They're still moving down the line here. We're still grating cheese and slicing tomatoes. Uh, at the same time, our staff is replacing cheese and lettuce in the back of the device. So humans are still interacting with the system while it is autonomously moving. Another example of this, you can see uh, our second robot here, staff is assembling orders here on the front counter. And in the back, you see a staff member is refilling boxes uh, on one of the machines there. And again, we don't want to stop the operation of the machine to refill boxes. So these interactions are carefully choreographed. And we use the uh, Apple Watch to help coordinate those, uh, those actions. And then health and safety is another really critical thing to think about. It's one of the reasons that people haven't been been cooking in an automated way just in time, because it's really hard to get right. Um, so you're all familiar with NSF, I take it. That's right. It's the National Sanitation Foundation. <laughs> this is the governing body who writes the rules that we really had to build the machine to, to meet the standards of, as well as UL. And so we had to go through and work with regulators who had no idea what to do with us, especially when we told them what we were working on. They were all very confused. Um, but we had to hold ourselves to an exceptionally high bar. We worked with uh, the regulatory agencies on understanding the technology. Uh, the benefits of automation actually from a health standpoint are significant. Um, and working with them to get the device certified in the restaurant uh, before we open. Um, also, there's a lot of input variation if you're doing just-in-time and gourmet food. Food automation is not new. It's been done on the industrial scale for a long time. Uh, for example, the tomatoes that are sent to a subway are pre-sliced. They don't actually do the slicing uh, at the retail store. They have it done at a commerce area and then sent there. Um, but that unfortunately exposes that tomato to oxidation, which reduces its overall flavor. So when you start doing things just in time, one at a time, the problem gets a lot harder. There are no two buns that are exactly the same. They will act differently depending on temperature and humidity. Uh, and that scales for every single ingredient that goes into uh, our system. So our system has to be robust to a lot of input variation because gourmet means you don't necessarily have the same types of controls that you would otherwise have for an automated system. And again, on speed and timing, one, we've got to do it fast. Uh, if you've seen how quickly 
uh, the staff works at a uh, McDonald's, and there's a lot of staff there doing this, uh, they are putting orders out uh, you know, every few seconds. And it's a very fast rate. And for us to be competitive with them, not only on quality, but also in convenience, we have to have the burger machine putting out uh, burgers at a pretty fast rate. But we also do gourmet things, like that first station, when the bun drops through, is a porous bladder that is filled with clarifi uh, clarified butter. So it gets buttered, and then it gets toasted at 450 degrees for 90 seconds. And that gives it that beautiful golden brown toasty um, crust on the outside. If for some reason there is not a box underneath this in time to pick up the bun when it's ready, it would sit on the toaster for too long, and it would be over toasted and dry, which would be a negative experience for the guest. So even at the very beginning, we have to think about the timing of this and thinking about how long is it on the toaster, how long is it in the refrigeration system, and uh, how long overall does it take start to finish to completely assemble and cook the burger and get it to the guest while it's still hot. Some of the business challenges, which I won't go into much here, but uh, it is a difficult thing when you are the first mover in this space. We are, I think, the world's foremost experts on just-in-time dispensing of ingredients for sandwiches. Um, and when that's the case, you have a very open design space, which is exciting, but you also don't have a whole lot of references that you can look into on how to do something like this. Um, venture capitalists, especially in the early days when we were getting started, really had no idea what to do with restaurants. This is just a completely new thing for them. So we had to do a lot of educating for them to understand the opportunity that automation can have in this space, which is significant. Um, and then lastly, the lean startup approach, uh, the Steve Blank approach, uh, is not really applicable here. The idea that you get your product out to market and then do lots of iteration on it works for a lot of industries and products. It doesn't really work for food. People's first impression on food is really what they're going to take away from it, and it's pretty hard to, to change that. An example of that would be a company called Bistro Bots. They were a Y Combinator company that was working on a machine to make peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. They were encouraged to do lots of rapid prototyping, do lots of demos. Um, the San Francisco Chronicle wrote a scathing review of uh, one of their machines uh, because it wasn't complete yet. And I don't think that's at all a, a knock on the engineering team. I you know they had some very talented people there. But I think it speaks to how, in some spaces, getting something out to market first and then iterating on it really isn't a viable approach. Uh, but we had some advantages working for us. The first is that we didn't have to be 100% autonomous. A and that is such a big differentiator. When you think about autonomous vehicles, we're pretty far along in our capabilities now. I mean, the DARPA Grand Challenge was, it was 15 years ago now or more. It was quite some time ago. And uh, we've seen Tesla's autopilot come out. It's got a lot of capabilities. Uh, we've seen a lot of great demonstrations. But that technology to get to the point where it can be completely 100% autonomous to where that vehicle doesn't need to have a steering wheel, that last few percent or even fractions of a percent takes a tremendous engineering effort. In our case, if a tomato falls onto the conveyor, it just takes a two-minute interaction with our staff member to receive a notification on the watch, clear the tomato, and clear the notification. So we don't have to be 100%. We just have to be better from an efficiency standpoint. Um, also, in many cases, you have embedded systems that are governed by the constraints of the system. So if I'm putting out millions of devices, I care a lot about how much my processor costs. In this case, the cost of the processor, the availability of power, uh, form factor, were not really major constraints for us. So we leveraged that and over-provisioned these embedded systems wherever we could to give ourselves a lot of room to grow and to develop uh, new solutions and iterate. So in the world of being correct, uh, meaning the more maybe academic approach to cyber physical systems versus the first rule of startups, which is don't die. Some comparisons I would draw here are I think a correct way to design a complex cyber physical system might be to have a good understanding of the model of the system first and do something like model based design. Um, but frankly, that, that simulation effort, even if it was trying to empirically derive models for the system, would have been as much time as it would have taken us to just build and iterate on the physical system itself. 
And if a tomato slicer doesn't slice a tomato correctly, it's not that big a deal. Um, so we can actually handle the, uh, the failures. So we instead went for a much more rapid prototyping approach. So we've adopted Agile on the mechatronic side. So joint hardware software teams where they have all the expertise they need to solve a problem. Fabrication resources, electrical resources, uh, testing resources, software resources, and mechanical engineers work very closely together on project-based teams in a two-week sprint to try to advance and get new prototypes in to prove their ideas and theories as quickly as possible. And that's been a, a really valuable part of our design methodology is to just learn fast. Also, we would love to have clear requirements, but startups never have clear requirements. There were always a lot of changing to exactly how much cheese do we need to be able to dispense, exactly what throughput do we need in the restaurant, what is the, the threshold of reliability of the robot before we can open the doors confidently. Um, those requirements, like many other startups, it's really hard to get those requirements down up front. So instead, we went with the move fast and break things approach, uh, which was to just start building, set a target, see how close you can get to that target, uh, and uh, uh, if you break things along the way, we'll fix them. Also correct would be some kind of formal verification of the system. Um, we have some pieces that would potentially for allow for some of this, but again, the, the exercise itself would be rather time consuming uh, in a space where uh, we were probably going to learn more by doing integration early. And like most complex systems, most of the problems are going to evolve during the integration phase of the whole robot. So we built it, as you'll see in the restaurant, in a fairly modular way. So we had a nice way to separate the concerns of the individual systems. And uh, once we got them all working to high reliability, we plugged them all in. And no surprise, it didn't work as we expected. Uh, bun placement matters a lot when you're dispensing ingredients. How do you make sure that the sauce is starting at the center of the bun, uh, making sure that things move quickly enough so that it doesn't get cold? Uh, we learned these integration lessons only by integrating early and integrating often. And that really fits with that rapid prototyping agile approach. Uh, I do like to, oh, go ahead. Go back to the previous one. Oh. Um, so the, the, the middle one, clear requirement. I understand you didn't do, I can't, maybe it's hard to do formal requirements here, but does the, in terms of things like timing and which things have to coordinate, and did you, did you do anything uh, like um, test driven design? I mean, so are there more systematic things than just move fast and break things that you did that were useful? Or things that you could have done in hindsight that could have been useful? Yes. So we did have a fairly detailed requirements document. Uh, you will have to ask yourself the question when you are ready to open the doors if you can only hit a burger every 35 seconds instead of every 30 seconds, are you willing to delay the launch? And those are some tough questions, but we did have requirements to, to go hit. And I think by and large, we did hit the requirements we needed to for the successful launch. So we did trace back from requirements documents all the way through to implementation. Sometimes we found that we needed to re refine the requirements. Sometimes we found that we needed to redesign to hit them. Um, so there was definitely a, a cycle going back and forth. So it's not that we didn't have requirements. We did have very detailed requirements. It's just that the, uh, the nature of the progression of the technology didn't allow for us to wait as long as we needed to to hit every requirement 100%. Um, as far as the, the design methodology, you know, we, uh, we did perform a number of more formal analyses, risk assessments, uh, FMEAs, uh, and documents to help us understand the risks up front. We were working from very detailed, specific, or very detailed requirements from NSF and UL on the device, so we had a set of requirements that we knew we had to meet, and those we couldn't move on. Um, and so we did build those into the product as we started on the most recent. Uh, yes, so everything in the robot that touches food has to be anodized in a food safe surface. Uh, we have to have traceability of the temperature of the refrigeration system to make sure that it is within the requirements of the system or of uh, NSF. 
Um, everything has to be cleanable. So if it's really hard to clean, not good enough, it has to be able to be removed from the robot and cleaned following a, a, a system that they would approve by the dishwasher or three sink. Um, there weren't as many on the software side because we, we largely don't have software in safety critical loops, which was a really critical part of the design. So we were omitted from having to do any certification on software. What, what sort of safety uh, well, we really didn't have any that we had built into our system. So we built it in such a way that the reciprocating blades were never going to be something that you could physically contact. Um, or anything that gets hot, for example. Um, and so uh, I'm trying to think of any other uh, methodologies applied. Uh, you know, we, you know, in Agile, you do peer reviews and code reviews. We didn't really do much test-driven design. I, I found that tends to be more amenable for data processing or more like, in, like information-centric code. It's a little bit more different if uh, every time you try out a new test on something, you're also slicing a tomato. And you'll go through a lot of tomatoes that way. Are you going to say more about the use of scale charts? Yes. Okay. Uh, I do also like to mention platform-based design. I mean, we're building our first product, so I don't think we have a product portfolio yet. Um, but this is something that uh, Alberto San Giovanni Vincentelli uh, introduced here uh, that I try to think about often, the concept of exploring the application space and figuring out what you're learning about the application uh, independently of what's the architectural space. So by that I mean the architectural space is what potential hardware could we use, what embedded system could we use, what sensors and actuators could we use. Um, on the application space, it's figuring out how do we best slice a tomato? How do we assemble uh, the completed burger when it's done um, without trying to bog yourself down with all of the considerations and trade-offs that happen between the two and then going with a meet in the middle approach uh, to when you're finally ready to bring your solution into fruition. Um, I think this, this really came from a lot of challenges that Alberto observed in the automotive and, and aerospace industries where they had massive platforms and multi-tiered systems of suppliers. The way that I think about this now is a little bit different. I try to think about this in terms of, in the startup sense, the ecosystem. So there are a number of decisions that we made that were based on the ecosystem we could live off of, so we didn't have to think about that, um, that uh, pinch point in the design and still give ourselves flexibility. And so specifically, there's a principle, especially at startups, don't build expertise in something that is not your DNA. So in our case, we are focused on making a gourmet experience with assembling and cooking a hamburger. We don't necessarily need to be experts in real-time systems. We don't have to be experts in control. Um, do we really want to build that expertise in-house? Do we want to spin our own embedded microcontrollers and have a team of uh, electrical engineers building the optical mi op optimal microcontroller? The argument on this is to say, if that's not the DNA of your company, then you should find another way of working around that problem. And we've tried to do just that. So on platforms for innovation, this is a traditional Beckhoff industrial PC. Um, you could imagine a PLC, something very similar. They are hardened, they are tested, they are certified. Uh, they can be expensive. Um, but some of the downsides are the ecosystem isn't necessarily that big. And it's really hard to recruit, say, engineers from Berkeley or Stanford and get them excited about working on uh, a PLC, which is 60-year-old technology by some measures. Um, and the people who are developing solutions for this are probably less likely to contribute back to a community or post to forums online where we might go to find some help. So most of our robot is powered by an off-the-shelf embedded controller. This is a BeagleBone Black that sits on top of an ARM SOC, or TI SOC with an ARM processor in it. It's a $49 embedded controller uh, with 96 points of I.O. and uh, turned out to be very versatile and helpful. One of the big things about it, it's open source hardware, so we know how every component of it was made. We could manufacture it ourselves if we want, which took away the risk of vendor lock. Also, it runs standard off-the-shelf Ubuntu. And so the ecosystem there for the software support and the, the number of people using this application uh, was huge. So we had a lot of forums and resources we could reach out to 
whenever we needed support on something rather than having a support service contract and waiting for a technical support agent to get back to us. And uh, one of the, uh, the real advantages of these is that the SOC itself is present in lots of different embedded systems, so we weren't that tied to this architecture. It was fairly straightforward to change it if we needed to. Um, also, one of the compelling reasons for going with this type of a platform is this is just, in an abstract sense, it's just a Linux computer. And there's such a fast pace of innovation in IoT where suddenly we went with things like AWS where you can run a single Terraform script and have a whole ecosystem of servers running for you. Um, why not it, take that same technique and approach to solving a distributed systems question on our, uh, on our robot rather than building out something hand-grown on deployment and, and configuration and provisioning. So I always ask myself the question of who solved a harder problem? I, I shared with Sanjit earlier today, I had the privilege of, uh, of meeting uh, Wally Rines, the founder of Mentor Graphics, uh, at an event that uh, organized on the future of system design. And he told me a great story that his tools for electronic design automation, which came around at the time that uh, manufacturers were manually wiring and actually networking these, these uh, transistors together. He said he could convince everyone that this was a great idea, but he couldn't convince them to adopt the tools. He could only get the tools adopted when the problem got so hard they couldn't scale it by just increasing the sizes of the teams. He, his, his tools actually got value there when they got to a point where it was impossible to do it the other way. So I try to find people who hit the wall before I did and solved a harder problem than I did and I try to take those learnings and bring them back into the technology that we're building. So anti-lock brakes in cars first were developed for airplanes. Airplanes had a much, much more stringent braking requirement, and then that technology migrated into automobiles. Um, and another thing where the research side has been extremely valuable, um, this is a topic I bring up fairly frequently, and this comes from a uh, course Edward taught in uh, graduate school a while back and also some of the content and uh, the problem with threads is this is just a short list of the kinds of technical challenges you get with threaded coding. And I knew enough to know I wanted to avoid all of these landmines. And so uh, rather than build out an expertise in things that uh, how to avoid non-determinism, we instead employed software techniques that omitted the behavior in the first place. So we went with state machines and went with purely sequential code. In very few places do we actually write multi-threaded code, which meant that we avoided all of those landmines. We still wrote at a high level of abstraction. Our computers were fast enough that it didn't matter if we were only executing sequential code. But even this state machine is hard to get right. How do you know that your C code has correctly uh, executed a, a, the semantics of a, of a state chart? Well, what we did was we actually just use the graphical state chart tool, and as long as it is successfully executing its, uh, its code generation, then your code is correct by construction in the sense that it will execute a state machine. Uh, and this gives you logical parallelism, but at the same time means you don't have to write any parallel code. Uh, and this has been a tremendous advantage to us in the speed of development because we didn't have to do any threaded coding, but we could still talk together with the mechanical engineering team about what their system was doing. This is, I can't show you actual code from our system, but this is the classic uh, uh, traffic light example state chart implementation. It's an open source tool called You Can Do. I understand it's actually in use now in, in 149 as well. Um, and that was a huge time saver. So knowing what we wanted to avoid from a mind, uh, mind standpoint was really valuable. So an example where that research knowledge of CPS helped us dodge a bullet in a really big way. Uh, so the last piece of advice I'll share is, um, especially for those of you I spoke with earlier today who are close to graduating or moving on to, uh, to industry, uh, you're going to have some missteps. Uh, I've changed careers probably two or three times completely. Um, and it took me a while to find the academic uh, courses of interest. Uh, and then finding that I really love working in the food space was the last thing I would have anticipated. Um, so just keep your eyes open for opportunities you might not have otherwise anticipated where that expertise will really benefit you because you'll never really know when you have the opportunity 
to work on something like this that could really change the world. So that's it. Thank you. Any questions? What, uh, what led you to tie yourself to engineering and CFOs at all? There's really no requirement to, to be here in C, right? Uh, no, there wasn't. And we were in C++, um, which was also kind of speaking to wanting to code at a higher level of abstraction. I think that uh, we did evaluate and I was actually advised even to try to look into 100% Python for this. Uh, I think that would have been an absolutely viable path. Um, I think we ended up with C++ just because it was the more common language for embedded systems. And at the time, we felt like that would give us a larger ecosystem if we wanted to go for off-the-shelf drivers for any of our components. But I think you could look back at that and say Python would have probably gotten us there. Well, see, it depends on who you ask. Uh, if you ask, um, it's actually great advice that I got from uh, one of our board of directors uh, who was actually one of the program directors for the Stanley DARPA Car Challenge. Uh, and so his name is uh, Sven Stroban. And he told us that the moment someone says they think there's a software bug, go check the wiring. And that has often been the case. Um, how often do we get bugs in the system? Well. Um, it's more about how much time do we have to refine it. Have we covered every edge case? Have we looked at every possible behavior of the system? I can say that we've never had to use GDB because um, we've never had to look at byte or code level uh, behavior. Um, I can also say that we've not had to really dig down concurrency bugs because we omitted them by design. So if there was a logic error, it was at the state machine level usually. Um, and otherwise, of course, like all software development, there are occurrences there. Um, but I think it's more about the time it takes to um, just account for every edge case in a, in a complex system. So you have never had any timing issues, real-time? Real we had very few. Uh, and the SOC that we work with does have two small 8-bit um, microprocessors on it, or little processors on it. And we did actually code this on a couple of occasions for real-time things like reading signals in real-time that required that. Otherwise. The systems were executing at a fast enough cycle rate that we were able to accomplish the task. So we tried to avoid that as long as we could. I think the reality is you can only go so far with that before you actually start needing to do doing things on, in a real-time basis. Um, we did benefit from an off-the-shelf motor controller, for example, that did the low-level uh, control loops for the, uh, for the control of the system. Yeah, I'd say it's exactly the opposite. It did not simplify anything. Uh, burgers are hard. Um, pizza would have been a lot easier. It, burritos, I think, would have been easier. Um, but what we wanted to do was most startups fail not because of the technology. Usually, they get the technology to work. Um, most startups fail because of product market fit. And so we instead wanted to go after the largest segment of food in the United States. It's the most eaten food in the United States. Uh, and come in with a value proposition of a better quality burger and cheaper. It was the, the one thing that we felt like advanced the uh, automation in the commercial space, changed how we dined, and did it in a way that was the least likely to have a product market fit question. We do love burgers. I mean, the founder came from the burger space, so we all do love burgers. Yeah, that's correct. The, uh, the labor costs are one of the largest components of the burger as it's sold to you. And so with the, it's actually an increase on the spend on the cost of goods. Uh, and at the same time, there's a lot of benefits from automation on the gourmet quality. So the cooking is highly repeatable. Uh, we can dispense sauce down to the milliliter in precise patterns. Um, we can you know, tune and refine. The one thing that a traditional brick and mortar restaurant doesn't have is that uh, this is the worst our burger is ever going to taste. It's only going to get better from here as we refine software in the systems. Um, and we can do things like an over-the-air update, which was the first time ever that uh, menu has been changed at a restaurant with simply applying a software patch or an update. 
So we actually think we get benefits from the automation on things that humans just couldn't do in a kitchen. In many ways, that is what we did. We, we, um, we did do the Frankenstein models when it comes to rapid prototyping. We duct taped stuff together. Um, our first prototype for a cheese melter was an extremely bright infrared light where you couldn't even look at it when it was on. It was so bright. Um, and we just tried to iterate on that quickly to get the mechanisms and the function down. Um, the aesthetics were very important, so there were a lot of things where we used unusual mechanisms, like using air to dispense buns. Uh, or an interlocking conveyor with uh, kind of finger-like interlocks um, to move things forward where they were really driven by that design aspect because you look at a bun dispensed by air and a wooden block drops down to slice it and you go, well, that's, that's mysterious and wonderful and you know, it's very interesting. Um, for systems like that where uh, we actually opted for more sophisticated mechanisms from a standpoint of design, uh, we did try to prototype those earlier. So for us, uh, we have, um, we've talked about this a little bit publicly, but this was our first store, and the challenge for us is to build more. Do you think that's going to be a technical challenge, because it's just replicating what you did here? Well, I think that uh, it's, it's one thing to do it once, and it's one thing to do it uh, thousands of times. And so we're trying to bridge the gap between those. 